Jane for always saying yes anytime I ask you to do this. So thank you. Kevin, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, like Kevin said, my name is Shane Wiegand. I'm a fourth grade teacher uh, in the Rush Henrietta Central School District. I'm one of the co-leaders of the Past Stone Foundation Anti-Racist Curriculum Project. I also serve on the boards of City Roots Community Land Trust, Connected Communities, and the Beachwood Neighborhood Coalition, um, as well as the Police Accountability Board Alliance. Um, and a lot of the work that you're going to see here today comes out of those experiences uh, with activism around housing and policing in the city of Rochester, um, as well as from my upbringing in the town of Webster. And most importantly, this whole talk was birthed eight years ago when one of my fourth grade students asked me in January around Martin Luther King week, as we learned about Dr. King and segregation in the South, the student asked me, Mr. Wiegand, did this happen in Rochester? Did we have civil rights here? And I, I was flummoxed. I had no idea. I, growing up in Webster, I grew up in a school where I never had a black teacher. I sat next to maybe one, two students of color. And it never occurred to me that civil rights was something or that racism was something that could be an issue here in our community. And when the student said that, it was like a light bulb went off. And I realized I grew up in a pretty segregated community and I had no idea why. Um, and so I said, I'm gonna start looking into that. And I started learning about the uprising of 64, about maybe the first Black Lives Matter protests in 1962 when Reverend Gibson from Memorial AME and Rufus Farewell, who had been brutally beaten locking up his gas station in the redlined Corn Hill neighborhood, marched on City Hall demanding justice uh, for Rufus Farewell. And we'll talk more about that. But I started to research this stuff and got back to my students the next week. I, I learned about Dr. Walter Cooper, uh, who uh, faced housing discrimination, was the first person of color to integrate Henrietta, and uh, so many other things you'll learn about him tonight, as well as Dr. Holloway Young, who was the first black principal in the city school district um, and fought housing segregation, sexism, and so many other things in our community. Um, also, over these years, I started putting together together a talk that I shared with adults and uh, with other students and teachers. I've gotten to train over 200 teachers uh, around the greater Rochester area. And uh, this last year or so, the Past Stone Foundation with Stuart Mitchell, uh, we've been working together to raise funds and we are most of the way funded uh, to be able to offer free professional development around curriculum that's built on what you're going to hear today. Um, I'm co-leading that project with the amazing Kelly McNair, who is an equity leader and principal in the Greece Central School District. And you can see those girls in the picture on the left. I'm going to talk more about their story as we go. But first, a few quick sources for this presentation. One of the most important is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Rothstein came to Rochester last summer. I helped bring him with a path stone um, or organization to Rochester. And he's actually looked through all these slides. Uh, he's found two small mistakes. I fixed both of them, two misspellings and a date. Ugh, it was very upsetting, but this is the Rothstein approved version. Uh, you're gonna see a ton of uh, images from the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle archives, the most fun thing, uh, the New York State Commission on Discrimination from 1958, the Rochester Voices Project, as well as a whole bunch of interviews that I've done myself uh, with these folks uh, in our community uh, who are honestly civil rights legends, uh, heroes who have never stopped fighting this fight. Uh, and I hope that we'll be a part of that too. First though, before we get going, I think it's important to talk about some definitions. I love Ibram Kendi's definitions and we're gonna use racism as a marriage of racist policies and ideas that produce and normalize racial inequality. Your intentions and your good heart doesn't matter. For me, I uh, got to college, it was the end of my freshman year and I told a student of color that I was in class with, I said, I don't see your color. And uh, it was a totally racist comment and the student said to me, that's super racist. What are you talking about? You don't see my color. I'm a black person. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> but like, I don't see color, man. Like we're all the same. And they corrected me. I felt super defensive. I said, but my intentions are great. And that student said, your intentions don't matter. What you said impacted me in a negative way. And it was, it was something that was true and fails to see how racism exists in these, in these places. And that just it was this paradigm shift for me. And that defensiveness, as I felt it, I started to, I had a choice. I could reject it or I could embrace it and ask more questions, do some of the hard work and learn about some of these things, which I think made it easier for me to answer that student's question. And it's one of those things I'm still working on. A racist policy, according to Kendi, is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups, whereas an anti-racist policy, what we're searching for, is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups, laws, rules, procedures, and even curriculums. Before we begin, though, I want to center us with a quote from one of my favorite books, 
white fragility. And those moments when you feel defensive like I did, or where it feels a little bit overwhelming, and I love those group norms at the beginning, thank you. Um, remember this, she writes, the key to moving forward is what do we do with our discomfort? We can use it as a door out and blame the messenger, disregard the message, or use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? And what would mean for me if this were true? So let's start with the good stuff. Uh, we come from an incredible community with a legacy of fighting for freedom, the Underground Railroad, and innovation. People like Frederick Douglass, who felt more at home here than anywhere else in the country. Uh, folks like Austin Stewart, who were enslaved just down the road in Sotus and Bath, New York, who escaped and eventually opened the first Black-owned business, the first Black school, and a spot on the Underground Railroad right in downtown Rochester. Um, Pittsburgh, Judge Ashley Sampson, uh, a great uh, leader on the Underground Railroad right here at the Hargis Briggs House. Uh, of course, Susan B. Anthony, the famous suffragist and friend of Douglas, and the great innovator um, who solved huge technical problems in our world and made our world a better place, George Eastman, but also left a little bit more complicated legacy that we're going to explore a little bit later on. And part of that complicated legacy, and something that I think often we spend a lot less time on, is, is some of these hard facts that Act Rochester in their 2017 report shares, saying that African American kids in a region are more than four times as likely than white children to live in poverty four times, and that both African Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts in our region. How do we get to a place like that? Well, when you look at our census map, you can see just incredible hyper-segregation, sea of blue in our suburbs and a sea of green in our inner city, blue dot meaning one white person, and one green dot meaning one black. I show this to fourth graders and they always think this has to be 1950 or 1960. I show the same thing to high school students. They say the same thing. And then when they realize it's pretty much today, there's shock, there's wonder, and there's this realization that we haven't in our community really given the context behind this map and how we got to a place where in New York, statewide, our schools are the most segregated out of all 50 states. And EdBuild recently found in 2020, the nation's most segregating school district border is the dividing line between Rochester and Penfield. We are number one. When it comes to health, Common Ground Health has found that white privilege can literally mean life itself, up to nine years, because a child from Pittsburgh's 14534 zip code, born today, will live over nine years longer than a child from Rochester's 14608 zip code, that red line uh, Plymouth Exchange Cornhill neighborhood. We also have huge problems with wealth nationwide. In 2011, the median white household had a net worth of over 111,000, compared to only 7,000 for the median black household. So, what do we do, right? We have this legacy of fighting for freedom and of innovation, and yet we, we, we also have this current reality of just vast disparity. The central thesis of my talk today is really this quote from James Baldwin, who says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I wanna invite you all today facing some of these hard facts with me and acknowledging that people of color have always faced these hard facts in our community, especially when white folks have people in my family and my grandparents and great parents chose not to or directly participated in these things. So I got a quick thing in the chat, I got to check here. I can't see that while I'm presenting. Give me one second. Um, oh, just a hold on here. All right. So one of the first people uh, that are after Douglas and Stewart and, and folks like that is Howard Coles, editor of the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper, who really uncovered redlining in Rochester in 1938 um, when he unleashed his study on housing, finding that African Americans were being forced by real estate agents and banks into two neighborhoods of the city, uh, the seventh and third wards. Um, and he found in those neighborhoods, more than 30% of units didn't have running water. Um, he found um, that there were damp cells in some places, like on Portland Avenue, less than half the homes where people of color lived, uh, their landlords were not providing them with heat. Um, Dr. Uh, Lunsford, the first black doctor in Rochester, faced this head on in the medical realm, challenging the University of Roch Rochester Medical Center and Dean Whipple because they wouldn't allow people of color into their nursing or medical programs, and not for another 10 years. And Lunsford and Knox and many other leaders of color in our community fought and fought. 
uh, to get this. And eventually they did win. Um, if you're not sure about that Whipple piece, uh, whose name recently came down at the U of R because of some of this research, um, Whipple actually would send this form letter to any black applicant who applied, saying that they of course couldn't accept them in the medical program because during their clinical trainings, they would have to engage in obstetrics uh, and be examining white women. Next, we have a segregated nursery, things that Lunsford and Cooper and others would call out. In fact, the Journal of Medicine in Rochester found that the nursery at Strong was segregated until the early 1960s. Dr. Cooper's wife, Helen Cooper, um, found the same thing in 1953. Dr. Cooper says that he went over to Strong Hospital and found his wife on a segregated ward, separate but not equal. And as soon as he and his wife returned home, they vowed never to use Strong Hospital again. And when his son was born later, they chose to never, ever go back to Strong uh, ever again. And there's a common kind of thing in our community among many people of color, especially in some of those neighborhoods where Strong is a hospital that is still being avoided because of some of these stories. Anthony Jordan, the second black doctor in 42, did a huge study in conjunction with Howard Coles, finding that in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes was 50% higher than that of whites. And tuberculosis among people of color was two and a half times that of whites, and it was directly linked to housing. So people of color faced these things. They spoke out. They published in their own newspapers and the DNC. They marched, they protested, and yet oftentimes they fell on deaf ears. And some of the things that they protested and some of the things I want to invite you to face with me today are the way racist policies um, experienced uh, and, and realized themselves in the real estate industry through restrictive and racial covenants, uh, through redlining and the VA and FHA black mortgages that came out of the 1934 National Housing Act and GI bills, urban renewal and exclusionary suburban zoning policy that exists in Pittsburgh, Penfield and Fairport and many other suburban towns today. A quick note, the context for today is a period of time called the Great Migration from 1910 to 70 when millions of African Americans migrated from the South to the North, fleeing white domestic terrorism, Klan and white citizens councils, lacks of voting rights, land owning rights, and a whole host of other things. Oftentimes we think that people came here to work for places like Kodak or Bausch and Lomb, but actually the original big cohort of folks that came North came from Sanford, and they couldn't work at Kodak because they literally weren't allowed. And instead, they came uh, to pick fruit, Rochester suburbs and rural areas. So the first area we're going to face is the real estate industry. Meet Frank Drum, the president of our real estate board, responsible for enforcing the National Real Estate Association Real Estate Board's Code of Ethics, which he, he did enforce. And for over 30 years, this code read that a real should never be instrumental and introducing into a neighborhood a character, property, or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. A few slides back, you met Howard Coles, who actually knew about this, got his real estate license, and challenged it by showing people of color homes in white neighborhoods like the 19th Ward. <clears throat> Excuse me. Drum and his cronies actually made sure that Howard Coles was pushed out of the real estate industry and that any real estate agent who did this, the same fate they were met with. A few examples of how this played out. Um, Dr. Walter Cooper, um, and I got a couple things in the chats. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the Cooper said, uh, Dr. Walter Cooper says, I then confronted housing segregation in Rochester. It was 54 and the wife and I answered ads for 69 apartments and they were refused at all of them. One of those apartment owners was the Amico Farish apartment. So it was they called the Farish Foundation. In 1957, Alice Young also faced this. A few years later, she actually went on to become the first black principal in the Rochester City School District. But a few years prior, um, she and her husband, James, who were upper middle class, they went to the bank and not a single bank in town would pre-approve them for a mortgage in the 19th Ward, which at the time was a 100% white neighborhood. No real estate agent would show her and her husband a home in those neighborhoods. But what they did is they reached out to a white friend, Harper Sibley, at the NAACP, the White Telegraph Fortune, who actually gave them money and bought them a house in the 19th Ward on Millbank Street, sight unseen, the Youngs never got to go inside it. She bought them the house, did a private mortgage, and this is what the other 57 families in the 1950s and early 60s did when they bought their first house. Now, the next morning, Young uh, and, and her husband woke up and found a note in the mailbox from the Ku Klux Klan of Millbank Street, 
with this incredibly offensive language, um, uh, threatening them, threatening them with their life, and they received uh, threats for the next 17 years. I got to have a lunch with Alice uh, a few months ago before quarantine. She asked that when I tell her story, I include a white family across the street, the Bushes, who were the only family on their street who stood with them, protected them when the Klan came calling or when neighbors would threaten them, um, and stood by their side and even helped them get the FBI involved to stay in their home, of which they lived in for over 17 years. We don't often think of our area as a clan country. Um, uh, we often don't think about our area as clan country, but in fact, this right here is a, a practice field where East Irondequoit uh, schools, their high school, has their football practice field. It used to be John Ott's farm, and gatherings of eight to 20,000 Klansmen, most years in the 20s, would gather here uh, to celebrate white supremacy. Just some horrifying images right in the Democrat and Chronicle. The next area, though, of racist policy is racial restrictive covenant. Um, and we know about like that white and black water fountain in the South, that really public symbol of segregation. Now, a just as public, but less in your face symbol is, is a deed restriction. And whenever you buy a house, you get a deed, and there's a list of rules that are legal for how you can enjoy your house. Things that are great, like my neighbors not allowed to have a you know a grain distillery in their backyard, which for me, I'm pretty grateful for that. For my next door neighbor, they can't have cows. Also something I'm pretty relieved by. Um, but one of the things that was actually like the most popular thing across our county uh, and nationwide was something called a racial restriction that said no person of color could live on that land. The man on the right was our first county manager in Monroe County, Clarence A. Smith, actually from Pittsburgh. Um, and he uh, and the county uh, legislature sold lots of land. And on many of the tracts of land, especially on Bellamy, Thornton, Windale, and the Newport Heights tract, they wrote racial restrictive covenants into those deeds. Connor Dwyer Reynolds uh, at Yale Law School, uh, he actually pulled these out of the clerk's office just last week, uh, proving that the jury segregation was really happening done by the county. You can see no persons other than of the Caucasian race shall ever use or occupy these lots sound, signed by the county manager uh, over to the head of the Real Estate Association, Frank Drum. This happened all across our community. And I'm going to get a little overkill on you. One place is Brighton, the Meadowbrook neighborhood. It was so carefully planned that when Kodak uh, started the Kodak Realty Corporation uh, to buy this land and the um, what, what are they called, the uh, ESL Bank, uh, to finance these mortgages, Harry Haight wrote onto every single one of the deeds that no lot or dwelling shall be sold to or occupied by a person of color. And this is the whole Meadowbrook area, the Bone Still area, Cota Vista, uh, Kodak, right at it. And, and right along this same period, they had this hiring policy of not hiring people of color. And were even dinged in the 1939 uh, New York State Temporary Commission on the Urban Population, finding uh, that in Rochester, of the over 35,000 employees in private firms, only 70 were black. And that at Kodak, of over 16,000 people, only one person was black and zero were African American at Bausch and Long. This happened also at the Council Rock Estates in Brighton, where the DNC would advertise, look at the bottom left, rigid restrictions for the desirable social character of the homes. And you can see the photograph I took of the deed right there. Same in Pittsburgh, uh, East Avenue Estates, developed by Grafton Johnson and General Realty. Uh, you can see these homes also advertised as being rigidly restricted and the deed being right there. Fairport and East Rochester or Parrington in the Forest Hills neighborhood, over 2,000 homes in uh, West Rondequoit, including one of those homes, the founder of Wegmans, Walter E. Wegman, who on one of these 2,000 lots had this exact covenant. In the 1950s, even though they were illegal, he made sure um, that the next buyer of his home kept that racial deed restriction on the land. The Forest Lawn, Coronado Beach neighborhood in Webster, Dayton Corners, Penfield Manor in Penfield, Gates, uh, you've got Norman Huck, the president of the Builders Association, uh, over 250 homes right along Brooklyn Country Club. Uh, Gates Acres Gardens in 1939, actually the head of the Rochester um, Bar Association, uh, Earl Case, he put these into all the lots in Acre Gardens and Gates. So this wasn't like some side thing that like a few kind of hardcore racists were doing. This was the county executive. This was the head of the Rochester Bar, the head of the Rochester Builders Association, 
and Frank Drum, the head of the National Real Estate Board, or the Rochester Real Estate Board. Uh, you can see here in Greece, the Dewey Stone Truck, Denise Road, Moorwood, even stipulating that Italians and Black people couldn't live in those homes. Greece, Latona Homestead, same in Rochester, my neighborhood. I live in the Beechwood neighborhood, uh, North Linton, Browncroft neighborhoods, and the 19th Ward. In fact, Judge Reuben Davis, the first Black judge in Rochester, um, describes his experience facing these head-on my wife and I were looking for a house. It was 1958. We saw a house that we liked on 135 Elmdorf Ave in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee. Now, I'd say there were probably four black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee Street at that time. One of those families was Dr. L. Young. The owner refused to sell to us because we were black. And there was a restrictive covenant in the deed that these houses when built were not to be sold to people of color or to Italians. Now a lot of time folks who are Italian and Jewish who are also discriminated by these deeds uh, and by the FHA um, ha have said, you know, wow, like we've had it just as bad. But it's important to note that in 1944, the GI Bill gets passed. And when the GI Bill gets passed in 44, um, Italians and Jewish folks are legally deemed white in the eyes of the federal government and are, are able to get VA and FHA mortgages to buy their homes, whereas black veterans returning from World War II uh, and just any black individuals did not have that same access uh, to those resources. Here are some of the places that I found these covenants so far. And I want to say look on Wednesday or Thursday. City Roots Land Trust, of which I'm a member, as well as the Yale Law School, will be publishing a huge report on racial restrictive covenants and what we can do about them. It should be in a lot of the news sources, so it, it's going to be incredible. Get excited. I've helped write it, and I am beyond, beyond ecstatic about what, what it's going to do, I think, in our community. The next area of racist policy, though, is the New Deal, particularly the National Housing Act of 1934. This comes in the wake of the Great Depression. There's a huge housing crisis. And FDR, who's not from the South, and Senator Wagner, also not from the South, proud New Yorkers, they pass one of the most racist laws since slavery in our country, uh, the National Housing Act, which creates the FHA mortgage. It creates the 30-year fixed interest rate mortgage with very little to no money down. And it was exclusively for white folks because written into the FHA underwriting manual by Francis Babcock, who in 24 uh, was the man who invented race-based home assessment in Chicago and was hired because of that race-based home assessment skill to come in and write the underwriting manual for how this law would be carried out. He said that if any neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. And the racist idea to justify a change in racial or social occupancy leads to instability and a reduction in values, something of which there was no evidence or research ever done to show that that was proof or true. They also go on to mandate that deed restrictions like the ones I just showed you in Rochester, should be imposed upon all land, prohibiting the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they're attended. Many of you may have heard of the Levitt towns. Almost 8% of the country's suburbs in the 40s and 50s were built by the Levitt brothers, all of which they built by using government financing to buy all the home building materials up front. They couldn't get those home building materials and those dollars unless they put these deed restrictions on there. In fact, they go even further, saying that highways and parks and rivers, they should be in place to separate black and white neighborhoods or inharmonious racial groups. And that brings you things like 490 and the inner loop. Now, we're looking at these federal policies, things brought by folks who oftentimes I think we thought of as kind of like northern liberals or the good guys. But Ibram Kendi gives us a different way to think about this. And his masterwork stamped from the beginning saying, Time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas, like the ones you just saw, in order to justify the racist policies of their era, like this policy that gave white families the opportunity to buy homes and not black. He goes on to say uh, in the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, another way to think about it is the ultimate goal of racism is the profit and the comfort of the white race, specifically of rich white men, which includes myself and my father and both of my grandfathers. Both of my grandfathers in the 50s and 60s got 30 year FHA or VA mortgages with almost no money down uh, to buy homes. One of my grandfathers, he was pretty poor, but he still was able to buy a home his first year of being in elementary school, a uh, sixth grade science teacher. Um, he buys this tiny little home in Council Bluffs, Iowa, sells it, buys a much bigger home, uses that equity to send my parents and my uncles to college, 
help send me to college. My dad moved to Rochester to work for Xerox with an engineering degree, and that wealth got passed down. To where I'm standing before you today, I own a home in Beechwood. Uh, I don't have any debt but my mortgage. And, and when I've had mistakes, like crashing my car when I first got out of college, uh, like, I mean, my parents were able to you know, drop me a couple thousand dollars to help me pay for that so that I didn't go broke and didn't have to choose between paying rent um, and fixing my car so that I could get to work. And, and this is where that area of wealth being created by the government exclusively for one group of people, people like myself, it's so important to recognize that history, to own that, and to have that conversation in your community and I think with your family. So how do they enforce the racial segregation? This is where that term redlining comes in. They were actually called residential security maps. And neighborhoods were, were, were rated like this. Green and blue, the best, most desirable neighborhoods, meaning predominantly white, um, business class type folks. Yellow areas meant definitely declining day laborers, uh, maybe uh, second generation uh, people who have Im immigrated, and redlined areas were deemed hazardous. And the hazard, aside from maybe environmental issues like the vacuum oil plant in the Plex neighborhood, specifically had to do with this, which was on every one of the reports, all of which, if you go online, you can look this up and you can read every neighborhood, including the ones in Pittsburgh that were rated. 75% of Corn Hill, red line neighborhood, was black, and 10% was foreign, right? And, and you can see they're looking to see if a neighborhood's even being infiltrated. Pittsburgh, Oak Hill, the East Avenue Estates, if you are, were really sharp, you'd remember I showed you this neighborhood earlier. It's the neighborhood that had uh, deed restrictions on every one of the homes by Oak Hill. And it worked zero, uh, almost 20 years later, 0% black, 0% foreign families, and making almost triple the income of the folks in the Corn Hill neighborhood. Meanwhile, as, as the suburbs started to grow from these tiny little towns of five to eight, 9,000 people, um, and they get massive influxes of government money to build out, almost all of those homes went to white folks. In fact, the redlining went so well in our community that when Dr. Cooper uh, was the first person of color to integrate Henrietta in 1958. Other members of the NAACP joined, and by 1960, Henrietta was the most integrated suburb of Monroe County, of all of Monroe County, with 11 individual people of color. Talk about integration. Now, in the Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, he writes that the FHA and VA insured half of all new mortgages nationwide. This wasn't some tiny surplus. It was a policy that created and built our suburbs and our communities. In fact, they gave out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance. And of that $119 billion government handout, over 35 million families benefited and 98% of them were white. Like this family that Douglas Fox sell in 44 is given the first GI loan that was whites only to uh, and right here in Rochester. So you gotta ask yourself, all right, we're the home of Frederick Douglass, right? And Susan B. Anthony. People in Rochester couldn't have wanted segregation. They, they, they must have said something and, and stood up. This couldn't have been something that our towns wanted. It was something, maybe it was just done to us. But in fact, an interesting thing and piece of context that helps us think through this is something called a blackface minstrel show that reveals sort of the tone uh, of just white supremacy in our community. Um, a blackface minstrel show uh, was something that from 19 to 1968 in Monroe County was huge. Every single winter and spring, uh, churches, schools, fire departments, um, and town halls, Kiwanis clubs, and the Rotary Club, they would put on these fundraisers where you'd have three or four main characters, Jim Crow, Jim C-O-O-N, Jim Dandy, and Mr. Bones, uh, who would blacken their faces with burnt cork, draw on garish and pink lips, and they would mock the intelligence of people of color and educate both community members and especially children about how they should view people of color. For example, this is the front page of the Honeyway Fall Times in 1960. These people are still alive in full racist blackface, proudly being celebrated as this great thing on the front page. Kodak also published these photos of their annual minstrel show that the executives put on for their employees at Kodak Park, including the Kodak Park minstrels you can see right there on the left, even dressing up their children in these black faces. Schools in Pittsburgh, like Allendale Private School, um, some of Rochester's biggest names, like Daniel Beach of Harrisburg Law Firm, John McGuckin, who the soccer field is named after at Allendale and Harley, uh, and some of these other folks, uh, like the Shumways, who own the Continental Beauty School. Some of the biggest names in our community, you can see these folks in blackface 
in the paper back in the 1940s. Um, same with Pittsburgh, the Holy Name Society, the St. Louis Parish, they had their annual minstrel show. Sort of the Pittsburgh Masons in full blackface. Uh, in uh, the late 19, or early 1950s, Newark Junior High School, uh, same with RIT and the redlined uh, Third Ward. Um, you can see some of the other towns here that hosted. It was pretty much every town, almost every single spring or winter including, of course, the city of Rochester. So one of those things that kind of shows us that people are being taught this and that these, these kinds of policies and segregation are good. In fact, the NAACP with Flora Harris, Harper Sibley, Quentin Primo, and others, they fought back and for years waged a campaign sending letters to town halls, uh, to, uh, to schools across the county saying, please stop doing this. One letter they wrote to the editor in the DNC said this. And I think it exemplifies what I'm trying to get at with this point. Primo writes, blackface minstrel shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all of the dark skinned people of the world. And while after Martin Luther King's assassination, there was like a, a shift where these shows started to go away in our community, to the point where I grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, and I just learned nothing about race at my church or, or at my school. Um, and I, I think that's a place where we're sometimes at today, where what we're teaching instead is sort of a silence, which says quite a bit as well. Next, I want to talk about how this really played out. Look at some of the stats, not just some anecdotes. This is the 1958 New York State Commission Against Discrimination. And while the people of color who advocated to have something done, they didn't action, they did get a report, something that often happens in our community still to this day. Oops, hold on a second. All right, uh, it found quite a few things that help us understand the impact of redlining. Finding that in the 50s, 80% of people of color in our county lived in just two redline neighborhoods, the third and seventh. And in those two wards, over 1,600 units had no bathroom or a shared bathroom. And in more than 2,000 units, there was more than one person living in each room. In fact, Connie Mitchell, ran for public office against Lester Peck because of the redlining and these racist policies that were happening. She writes, we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house on Greg Street in the third ward, the real estate agent told us, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson Ave. They're just not open to black people. So we were confined from Jefferson Avenue back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. Eventually, Connie Mitchell, she won on her second try and began to fight that fight uh, in the Monroe County office. Only a few years after, county supervisor, uh, who, was, uh, who was still on board at that time uh, for Pittsburgh, had been putting these deed restrictions onto land that the county was selling. Remember that. The report also found that in these two wards, 30% of all units had no running water. And if you remember, 20 years prior, Howard Coles had found a very similar statistic in his Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper report. And yet the county and the city they, they, those sort of uh, comments, they fell in deaf ears. In the 50s, only 57 black families were able to own a home outside of the third and seventh ward. One of those families were the Wells, who joined the Coopers and the Lees, many other families in Henrietta. In fact, in 1958, the report found that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to a person of color in any suburb. And almost all of the homes that were being built were being financed by the FHA or VA. And the ones that weren't were following those same FHA VA guidelines, according to Richard Boston in The Color of Law. So when you think about this, and you look at Barrow Architecture's recent report on uh, Pittsburgh home development, they found that new bank lending practices, government programs, led to massive single family uh, increase in suburban housing dramatic growth happened so that from 1950 to 70, the town of Pittsburgh jumps from 9,000 to over 25,000 residents, of course, the majority of whom are entirely white because it was the federal government that helped build towns like Pittsburgh. And those homes that maybe were selling for thirty dollars to $50,000 at that time, of course, today are going for two to four to five to even higher thousands of dollars, right? So when you look at the neighborhoods in Pittsburgh that they map out in this report, these are all the neighborhoods that were built during this time with these federal subsidies. And I'm just going to go quickly through them, but you can see every one of these streets, people of color wouldn't have been able to live there unless they did what the Youngs did, finding a white person to buy them the home and sneakily sell it to them under the table through one of those sneaky straw man deals. I think Sam Dent maybe was the first person of color 
to make it out to Pittsburgh, and I don't quite have that year. That's according to Dr. Cooper, who worked with him at Kodak. Meanwhile, it wasn't just these laws, it was the attitudes of residents. When people of color, like the biases pictured here, moved into white neighborhoods, there was quite a bit of violence and resistance. The biases moved to West Irondequoit in the late 50s, early 60s, um, and that first year, they had death threats. They had bricks thrown through their front window in their living room, uh, threatening them with death if they didn't leave. So they sold their house and they joined the Coopers and other NAACP members in Henrietta, where they found a little bit more welcome. Meanwhile, folks like Peter Tolliver in Brighton, Pamela Hines and Gates, uh, and folks like Quentin Primo in East Irondequoit, when they tried to move into their neighborhoods, they were met by petitions where every neighbor on their street would sign a document saying, we don't want you to live in our home. And even sometimes in the case of Tolliver, they would go to the bank and buy the house out from under the person before that deal could close. So quite a bit going on here. Meanwhile, White developers like the Farishes, like Frank Drum, Norman Huck, and others were making millions. The paper said in 1973 that Farish had made over $100 million in real estate just in Rochester alone, building some divisions like Pine Hill Drive, Pittsburgh here, pictured here in Fairport, all of which was whites only. And I don't say that to, to pick on these three or four big developers who did capitalize largely on these funds, but more to say that no matter what their intent is, and I don't know what Farish's intent is, they benefited from these racist federal policies, as did the other folks like my family that were able to buy homes in these neighborhoods. Meanwhile, one of the final things I want to address is urban renewal and displacement, sort of the early forms of gentrification that come out of all these racist housing policies, where these red line neighborhoods are starting to fall apart, there isn't running water, there's all these problems. So the government says, all right, we're gonna give cities like Rochester upwards of $30 million to clear out uh, whole neighborhoods that are blighted and redlined, and to build highways to kind of separate you know, white and black neighborhoods, and to build some maybe some high rise apartment buildings. Um, and so you can see on the right, Elmer Milliman, the head of Central Trust Bank and one of the heads of the Urban Renewal and Planning Committee, and John Dale from the city, um, they were on a whites only panel. In fact, Howard Coles tried to get on this committee and Howard couldn't get on, even though he'd been a real estate agent and had expertise in these areas. Um, and you can notice in the seventh ward, over 886 families were displaced from their homes, the majority of whom were African American. And in the third ward, over 850 families. And where Strong Museum is today, the Savannah Street area, the Southeast Loop Project, it was close to 300 families, maybe a few more. Um, to continue on here, one example of how this played out is that these neighborhoods, while they were redlined and people of color were steered there, and oftentimes Jewish and Italian folks were too, these were fairly integrated neighborhoods um, where black and white folks, they lived together. Obviously there were big issues, but they did live together. Um, they went to church in these places, but when urban renewal came through, it really tore up some of that social fabric. And one of the examples I wanna share is the story of the Church of God in Christ and urban renewal. On the right is Reverend Caldwell, who after uh, 20 years of fundraising, they built their church in 1940, the Church of God in Christ in Ormond Street in that seventh ward. When urban renewal came through, that church was raised and Pepsi built a $1 million factory subsidized by the government right on the place where that church is. Um, and, and so you see how that, the Staropoli family uh, were the owners of that factory and benefited greatly from that. And Frank Staropoli Jr., uh, the son of Frank Staropoli Sr., who took over as the next uh, CEO uh, in the early 70s, said that he nor his father ever hired a black person to work there, although some uh, Puerto Rican families were hired. Uh, but it kind of gets at this church that loses its place of worship and ended up having to rent on Lindenhurst Street for several years, um, really losing this place that they had invested so much in. Similarly, it's the story of Rufus, Fair excuse me, Rufus Farewell, uh, who I mentioned earlier. There he is on the right. Um, he was sitting in a wheelchair there because he'd been put there by the police officers of RPD who thought he was robbing the gas station he managed on Plymouth uh, and Columbia Streets in the redlined area of uh, the Third Ward. Um, here he is at this protest held at City Hall demanding justice and accountability for the police, something that you can see in our community today. All of these things lead to the 1964 uprising. They lasted three days with over a thousand folks being arrested, um, 1,500 National Guard troops coming out. Strongly recommend watching July 64. It's online for free if you wanna watch it. It's an incredible look at this story. Carolyn Vacca, the county historian, actually went through the arrest records and found a correlation between folks who participated in the uprising as being the folks who were displaced by urban renewal, didn't have running water, or had been victims of police brutality.
Finally, though, Rochester wasn't alone. This happened in almost every city across the country, especially in the North, where there were huge uprisings because of the same sort of things. Redlining, urban renewal, uh, lack of running water, lack of basic amenities. And so after the assassination of Dr. King, Lyndon Johnson signs into law the Fair Housing Act, which tasked HUD and only HUD with the task of affirmatively furthering fair housing. It didn't say how, and it didn't really give it much meat to do anything about it or teeth. So HUD could potentially take funds away from communities that were failing to affirmatively further fair housing. But the thing is, when Nixon comes into office, George Romney, his HUD secretary, who's pictured here on the left, tries to enforce this in Michigan, where he was from. Very quickly, he gets fired by Nixon, who in his justification for firing him and ordering the next HUD secretary to cease and desist from ever enforcing the Fair Housing Act, which did eliminate redlining and it did eliminate racial restrictive covenants, but it didn't put anything in place to correct the wrong that had been done from redlining, said this in his memo to John Ehrlichman justifying it, saying, I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, that forced segregation, that is forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live for the most part in black neighborhoods and will there be predominantly black schools like Webster and Pittsford and predominantly, or like the city and predominantly white schools uh, like Webster and Pittsford where I grew up. The last and final thing I'm gonna talk about is exclusionary suburban zoning policy. Something that became huge in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when almost every town in our area and nationwide responded to the civil rights movement and uh, some of the eroding of uh, the National Housing Act uh, and its ability to discriminate based on race. They decided to discriminate using class as their tool with race-based motives. Um, so for example, in 66 in Penfield, uh, this is from a, a town planning board meeting where town board member Walter Peter received 40 uh, calls from 46 residents saying that their plan to allow some affordable housing or apartments was being used as a wedge to bring black people into the town. And Peter said we should listen to residents and that's what they did when they created uh, their extremely restrictive zoning policy, which led to even a Supreme Court case worth the Selden in 75. You can see in 71, the Penfield Homeowners Association uh, talking about this over in Scribner and uh, uh, Five Mile Line Road, uh, threatening the things that could come to their property if Penfield uh, didn't have exclusionary zoning. Meanwhile, in Pittsford, uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Pittsford uh, voted to zone over an eighth of its land to be incredibly exclusionary with huge lot sizes so that the homes had to be extra big and that no affordable apartments or housing could be built. And a group of actually white pastors in Pittsford came together with a 12 point platform saying um, that if this plan in Pittsford, which did go through, went through, it would rezone over an eighth of Pittsford land to top grade residential and it would make it an affluent and exclusive ghetto. Um, and you, you can see how they kind of go into this and that's kind of what's happened in towns like Pittsford and Penfield and Webster. In fact, the city called on suburban towns saying, like, your zoning ordinances are only a, a showing of the willingness of the community surrounding Rochester to allow residential living for all income groups. So these documents were exclusionary things. And the Fair Housing Act didn't outlaw zoning based on income, just on race. So there's maybe two or three small places where some affordable housing has been built on Rochester's east side. Uh, Phillips Village and the Pines of Parenton, most of which was able to be built because HUD, uh, the Housing Act had passed. But in these communities, today they're still less than 20 to 30% African American and are oftentimes made up of, of older folks who can no longer afford the taxes in their towns. And that was how those things were built. And yet they carry some negative stereotypes that I think are really messed up and wrong. And that brings us to here, where you see housing segregation in Rochester today that lines up so directly with that residential security redlining map from the 30s. Lines up the same when it comes to concentration of poverty and wealth, owner occupancy, food insecurity and food deserts. Uh, places like Wegmans have completely taken their stores out of all of those red and yellow line neighborhoods. And now the city has only one. Um, same with asthma, uh, the highest rates in those previously redlined neighborhoods high blood pressure. You can go on Common Grown Health's website and just see so many correlations. And of course, life expectancy, which can be almost 10 years uh, gap between white and black and based on your zip code. Finally, 
One more way to look at the wealth gap that was created nationwide as well in our community. In 2017, Yale researchers found that for every $100 the average white family has in wealth, the average black family has only $5. And it's going to take black families 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth that white families have today unless we follow what James Baldwin called us to do in the beginning of this presentation. And we decide to do this, to accept that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I hope that you were able to join me in facing racist policy and folks uh, in the real estate industry, like Howard Coles did, uh, the way people like Judge Davis faced restrictive covenants in the 19th Ward. Important note, Judge Davis got that house, and he did it by getting a white person from the NAACP to buy the home for him and sell it to him under the table. The way Connie Mitchell and many others fought back against redlining and the VA and FHA mortgages, the way thousands protested in the streets in 1964, and the way some of you today may be part of the push for exclusionary, equitable, super, uh, more equitable and just suburban zoning policy, um, facing these issues head on like Metro Act did in the 70s, and hopefully some of you all will today. A quick thing though I do wanna show you is that when we do this with kids, because I think a huge problem with this is that for some of you, it might be one of your first times hearing some of these stories or some of these names that should, I believe, be household names in our community. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure our kids understand the community they came in, how it was, and to be able to face it like Baldwin calls us. So what we do is we actually just put primary sources in front of kids. We use something called a boxing protocol, where we start with a hard facts report and racial dot map. We let kids uh, do notices, wonders, ask questions, synthesize an inquiry question, such as when my class came up with what caused segregation and disparity. We look at the redlining map and compare and contrast neighborhoods and the kids draw their conclusions. We look at racial restrictive covenants, oral histories like Coopers, Coles, and Mitchells, the New York State Commission, minstrel shows, and DNC clippings from these times, and interviews with people uh, like, like those folks. In fact, kids are given the chance then to take what they've learned from those people, from those examples of folks who fought back, and if they want, completely voluntary, take action. For example, this girl in the middle, her name's Kalia, and a few years back, after this unit in my class, she came up to me and said, Mr. Wiegand, I think we have a racist policy in our school. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, we have no black teachers. And, and like, you're a great teacher, Mr. Wiegand, but it's not the same. Like, I want a teacher who looks like me. I think that's racist. And I was like, you're absolutely right, Kalia. So she said, let's go to the principals right now and talk to them about it. Of course, I was like, oh my gosh. And then I was like, wait, what did Howard Coles do? And she's like, well, he researched it and it got friends involved. So we got Bailey and Stimra and together, the three of us, the four of us came up at lunch every day for a few weeks. We researched, we made slides and we, we found the facts. We found we had 11 black teachers in Henrietta, 550 white, more than any suburb in Monroe County, except for the city. And so they had lunch with the principal. They shared their presentation. They got to speak to the assistant superintendents, the school board, the community foundation. And now I'm proud to say that because of these girls in Rush Henrietta, we've established a feeder program with three historically black colleges in Atlanta and are in the process of recruiting teachers of color so that Kaliat can truly have the teacher uh, that she deserves before she graduates from uh, Rush Henrietta. Meanwhile, we've also put together a whole uh, advisory committee that includes uh, your very own Kevin uh, Beckford and many other folks from across our community uh, to give input. Civil rights leaders like Joan Howard Coles, Howard Coles' daughter, folks like Dr. Walter Cooper, and many other folks uh, who have a stake in making sure that our kids learn this. Um, and finally, we would love your support. You can go to pathstone.foundation uh, to learn more about our project and help us get to our final goal. We've had a lot of great support from local foundations, um, but your support would be incredible, but I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. Finally, what are some of the ways that we can take action? One, you can advocate for anti-racist housing policy in your town's comprehensive plan and a countywide approach. We have this big task force coming up. It could be a rubber stamp to what's already going on, or because of advocates like yourselves, it could be something that puts into place meaningful anti-racist housing policy that does away with exclusionary zoning um, and makes huge changes in our community. You can ask your school board to teach this history. Many districts have signed on where they, they are working on this, all their teachers or some small groups of teachers in different districts. We would love to work with your community. You can support groups like City Roots Land Trust that reinvest in traditionally redlined neighborhoods through uh, permanently 
uh, affordable and community controlled land. Uh, of course, zoning policy supporting construction of affordable housing that's actually affordable below 450 to 30% of the AMI. You can support the citywide tenant union who is fighting eviction in Rochester. Uh, you can join us on August 6 as we uh, protest outside of the, of the, the courthouse downtown uh, as the eviction moratorium ends on that day. And, and thousands of folks are going to be uh, at risk of being evicted from their homes during a pandemic. Um, we encourage you to like them on, this, uh, on Facebook. And then finally, I think reparations have to be something that we consider and something uh, that in our community and nationwide have to be something that is something we do. So finally, as I close, I want to ask these sort of questions. I'd love to do a Q&A, but I'd also really like to get personal with this and ask, how have you been impacted by these racist policies? And if you're going to ask a question, I I'd like you to talk about that first. How have you been impacted by these policies? Um, if you're willing to do that, I think that would be powerful as to one, name this. It's not about your intent. It is about the impact. And then how are we going to move forward, create anti-racist housing policies in Greater Rochester? Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin or Lindsay. I'm not sure who's facilitating uh, to follow up our last 30 minutes or so with discussion. Um, Kevin, take it away. And do you want me to stop sharing or what should I do here? Actually, why don't you leave that up there for a second because I, I want uh, the first question to be uh, what you have there on the board. So before we open it up for questions, I just want to, we have about 37 people on the line. So I want to just be thoughtful when you go to share um, to, to be mindful of that, to, you know, uh, put some limit on your share outs so that everybody gets a chance to, to share. Um, a number of folks that are on the call today are seeing this for the first time. So th this is, I can imagine the feelings and the thoughts that they have. So if you could, that first question that Shane has, and Shane, I just wanna thank you again on behalf of everyone here and, and really for more community. Uh, this hits me personally here in, in Pittsburgh, you know, um,